I like to start every fantasy football season off with this sentiment. Y'all are going to get a lot of shit wrong in fantasy football. So am I. So am I. Despite all the research I do, despite all the big facts I lay out for y'all, I'm going to get 55, maybe 60% of the shit I say right, which means I'm going to get 40 to 45% of the shit I say wrong. So are you. The best gamblers in the world. There's a reason Vegas stays in business because these people, the best ones in the world, hit on 60, maybe 62, maybe 63, 65 if they had a fucking phenomenal season. They hit on 60% of their bets. The best ones in the world, people. Nobody hits on 80%. Nobody does it. It's gambling. It's fantasy football. We're all going to get shit wrong. I was thinking about dedicating a, a giant portion of this video to just screenshots of ignorant comments that some of y'all left on, on last summer's videos with your bold predictions and your hot takes and really, really, really wrong shit. But then I would have to do it on the flip side and tell y'all all the shit that I got wrong and it would be a mess and there would be no value given to you guys in the videos. At the core of my brand, I always want to give y'all some value. So we're going to look back on all the shit I said that I was completely fucking bonkers on. Sorry, I'm watching a British TV show and they, you, they use bonkers and they use proper and I wish I could use those words in my vocabulary, but it doesn't come off naturally. We're going to look at a lot of the shit that I got wrong. But we're going to dissect it. We're going to dive into the things that I got wrong, why I got them wrong, and how we move forward and learn from those mistakes, people. So I repeat, lesson number one. We're all going to get shit wrong every year, in every league, in every draft that we do. So going into 2020, make your opinion, relay it to those sources in my comment section, on Twitter, to your fucking friends at your job that don't care. By being a normal human being, stop being a cunt on the internet 2020. Somebody start that hashtag, please. Tuck your shirts in. Stop yelling. We're back for 2020, baby. Somebody start the damn video. So as you could tell from that intro, which is not really an intro because in 2020, we're not doing intros anymore. We're jumping right into the good stuff, the big facts, the shit that you come here for. Today's top 10 lessons learned is going to be a way for me to pry the value out of the shit that I got wrong. Lesson number one, we're all going to get shit wrong. It's a game. It's fantasy football. So don't be a fucking asshole going nuts about how you know you're right when the season hasn't started yet. Be nice on the internet. This is the first solo film I've done in a while, y'all. It feels good to get back in my zone. Done a lot of duo stuff, interviews, a lot of vlogs and things like that. But 2020 fantasy football is here. I'm ready to fucking rock and roll. This is the first of the individual films that are coming out. We're going to be doing one of these a week, probably up until NFL draft. And then I will up the tempo. Two a week, three a week, four a week, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve individual videos a week. That's a fucking enormous lie. But I like this. I haven't got to look you in the eye. I haven't got to seduce you with my buttery, crispy voice in quite some time. And these are my favorite videos to make. Ain't nobody telling me what to do. No one telling me what time to get on the damn video. It's beautiful. I got a crispy new mic, the Shure SM7B, hooked up to a fucking boom arm, to a Scarlett, to an audio interface, to a cloud lifter, to a fucking SaaS product. It's unbelievable the amount of technology and money you have to spend to make quality production. That's what we're doing all 2020, quality production. This is the schedule for the off season. Every Monday will be a behind the scenes interview with a top influencer in the fantasy sports space. Last Monday, we kicked it off with Andy Holloway, the fantasy footballers. Got very good feedback, possibly the only video on the internet that has zero thumbs down on it. I didn't think it was possible. But by the time you watch this video, I'm sure there's someone out there that went and gave it the thumbs down, but it was immaculate prior to this video. This week, we had Matt Kelly, the pod father of the Roto Underworld Radio. We're talking all marketing, advertising, business, that kind of stuff in the fantasy space, no player analysis. So those are fun interviews for me to have because I'm passionate about the marketing side of things. Every Tuesday, well, at least bi-weekly, if not every week, I will be releasing a vlog, which is what happens behind the scenes here at the brand, the, the HQ, everything big dogs got to eat related. Every Wednesday, we will have Noah, FB God, as most of you probably know him, and uh, Mike, my good friend Mike, at Mike Me Up. Make sure you go and follow him on Twitter, doing Dynasty content. I will hop in and out of those kind of things with them as I feel like it as the offseason goes on. So anything Dynasty related every Wednesday, these will be the Thursday videos. Friday will be Fade the Public, and that is all, baby. Let's continue rolling down the list. Number two on my top 10 things I learned this year, top 10 lessons to take away. This was something that we've all known, but I think people need to start taking a little bit more seriously, and that is coaching is the first 
It's the second and it's the fourth most important thing when it comes to projecting players for fantasy football. I mean, y'all might be wondering what the third thing is. I don't really fucking know. It was just a dumb like sentence that I put together. I would say the third thing is probably talent. Talent doesn't always dictate opportunity, but coaching does. That's why it's in here. And it is so damn important to understand the coach that is coming into a new system with new players, implementing a new scheme. So I wanted to look back at last year, see who the new coaches were, see who some of the new offensive coordinators were and see the impact that they made, see some of the outlooks that we had on them coming in what we could learn from that for better or worse coaches are going to do whatever it is they want it's their team they were hired and they're going to control shit regardless of what you think is going to happen regardless of what you want to happen regardless of what should happen if you think about it an nfl coach is handpicked there's only 32 of these guys in the entire fucking world so that's enough to inflate your ego to be the size of Layla Starr's new fake ass cheek implants. But give credit where it's due. I mean, they've worked this hard. They've worked up to this point in their life to get into that elite company of 32. So they probably have a pretty good idea of what they want to do and what they're going to do. So I created this little chart for y'all. There's no agenda behind this, and I'm sure there were some coaches or offensive coordinators that I left out, but these are the more notable hires that I thought of like off the top of my head when I was making the chart for this featured film. We have the Arizona Cardinals, who brought in Cliff Kingsbury. We have the Falcons, who brought in Dirk Cutter as their OC. Cincinnati Bengals, who obviously switched things up and got rid of Marvin Lewis, brought on Sean McVay's former protege, Zach Taylor. Dallas Cowboys brought in Kellen Moore. Minnesota Vikings, the whole Stefanski, blah, blah, blah. The Packers switching to Matt LaFleur, Tampa Bay Bucks, getting rid of Dirk Cutter, bringing in Bruce Arians, Jacksonville Jaguars, and the list goes on. This is not going to be a video of me breaking down the coaches. I will do that either next Thursday or the Thursday after that, looking at all of the new coaches that have entered the league that are taking over spots, the new OCs, the new head coaches, and how they will impact fantasy players this year. This is not that. This is just taking a look at what we've learned to cement this piece of analysis into your brain. You'll see on the chart what I've identified pretty much as the most important things when we're looking at coaches and their impact on their new team. It's the run to pass ratio, how often they run the ball, how often they pass the ball, and their pace. Their overall pace rank is going to dictate how many plays you get off in a given game. Even if you're a terrible team like Cliff Kingsbury, their team won five games, whatever it was, their pace, third in the NFL, dictates that they're still going to have a very high volume offense for statistics, even if they don't score a lot. So we look at the run to pass ratio, Show, we look at the pace to get a better feel for how high a player's ceilings are, how high a player's floor is. Of course, with all these lessons learned, hindsight is 2020. But I feel like we could have probably predicted a lot of these shifts with near certainty. And there are a lot of the same headlines that I preached to you guys in the offseason. For example, Dirk Cutter heading back to Atlanta. His pace and his passing percentage was extremely high during his time in Atlanta back in 2012 to 2014. Even when he was in Tampa Bay as the coach, these numbers were up to par. So there was no reason to think that the Falcons would not be an extremely high team, which is another reason why I was kind of down on Devonta Freeman because they don't throw to the running back. They don't run the ball a lot or successfully. So that was something we could have predicted. Another thing while looking at the chart, you see Green Bay, their pace, 19th in the NFL. They were slow and they ran the ball a lot. In 2018, they ran the ball in 32.5% of their plays. That jumped up almost a full 8% in 2019, up to 40.3% of their plays being on the ground. And it was very similar, if you look at the numbers, when Matt LaFleur was the offensive coordinator in Tennessee in 2018. People wanted to label LaFleur as this high-flying offensive genius coming out from under McVay. But when we looked at the actual numbers with him as the OC, they said otherwise. They said ground game, they said slow pace, and that dictated how the Green Bay offense were to run. And it was a, a mistake that I made. It was something that I should have taken into more account when I was looking at guys like Aaron Rodgers, like MVS, even though that might have been just a fucking talent thing. But it's like these things that you need to take into account. And Aaron Jones is going to get more play time, more passes, more groundwork. Minnesota, they're pass percentage dipped by nearly 14%, which is massive. I mean, we knew with Stefanski taking over as the OC, the offensive philosophy was in store for a monster swing on the pendulum. That was the talk all summer, and it did not disappoint going into the year. The Cowboys' pace under Kellen Moore was a thing of fucking beauty. Their passing rate went up by just 1.3%. They were still a run-heavy team, but Dak crushed career highs in passing attempts by 70, passing yards by over 1,000, ended up with over 4,900 passing yards, career high in passing scores by over 7 
touchdowns. Mike McCarthy takes over, but if he does in fact let Kellen Moore call the plays and run the pace of this offense, they should be in store for more passing goodness in 2020 as they were in 2019. Adam Gase, he's not on the chart, but the guy's just absolute fucking trash. Again, hindsight is 2020, and there's a lot of factors that go into these end of year numbers, but when doing the outlooks on fantasy players, coaching situations need to be a main focus going forward, no longer a secondary factor my friends again we're gonna dive really deep into the actual specific coaching changes that have happened so far this offseason i think there's probably a couple more spots left so i'm gonna wait till all of them play out and we know all the head coaches we know all the ocs next thursday or the thursday after that will be that video number three injuries still matter people all year long we heard people yelling at me for fading cooper cup I did so because he was coming off an ACL tear that happened last year in week like 10 or 11 of the 2018 season. We know medically, we know this, ACL tears take 9 to 12 months to fully recover from. Fully fucking recover from. Not a beat reporter telling you that he looks 100% while running in shorts. We know this shit medically. So... There's a process behind why I was fading Cooper Cup. It was nothing specific to Cooper Cup. If you go back to all of my videos when Cooper Cup came out as a rookie, I literally anointed him the white Keenan Allen. No one liked Cooper Cup as much as I did, but there's a process behind why I didn't like him this year. And for every Cooper Cup, for every Cooper Cup that I tell you all to fade because of injury concern, there are like nine AJ Greens, Delaney Walkers, Greg Olsons, Will Fullers, Cam Newtons, Eric Ebrons, Devonta Freemans, James Connors, Emmanuel Sanders that I also talked about going into the season that I am staying away from because of their injury concerns. They are under-rested or under-recovered because of the timetables that these injuries give them. Eventually, that shit plays itself out. Will I be wrong on a few of them? Of course I will, and I wish I had more fucking shares of them going into the year. But for the most part, we know how a lot of these play out, and people understate the importance of injury timelines medically speaking we have dr jesse morris from the fantasy doctors join us throughout the summer and throughout the season to talk about these things we got the information straight from the fucking source people we got the plug here at big dogs listen to the plug feel the plug let the let the plug fucking electricize your brains it's the same reason why i wanted dalvin cook this year, because he was two years removed from the ACL. Allen Robinson, two years removed from the ACL, not the year after. It's the reason why I will be heavily investing into Darius Geis this year, two years removed from the ACL. So I was wrong on Cooper Cup, obviously. Guy was the wide receiver seven fantasy points per game this year. So what was the actual takeaway? I will still be completely risk averse when it comes to injured players going into the year, but I will leave a little bit of wiggle room for younger players. I do think about it now that younger players obviously have a more rapid, quickly paced recovery time, speedier process than I had imagined. Cup was just 26 entering the year in his athletic prime, in the prime of his career, ripe, ready to fucking recover, and he did so. Prove me wrong. Shout out to Cooper Cup, but shout out also to all the guys that I told y'all to stay away from from the injuries. Older players coming into the year injured will still be far, far off my radar. These next few lessons, all about fat running backs. This is the moment y'all have been waiting for. Fat running backs will be the death of me. We're going to go from looking at overall picture things, schemes, systems, processes when I'm drafting and things I got wrong in that nature to diving into the specific players that I got wrong. Now, I did address Cooper Cup, so that was kind of segueing into this the rest of my mistakes revolved around these fat running backs yes i I understand they're not fat so y'all are gonna yell at me they're just big thick boned multiple c's the thumpers the ones that don't catch passes these were the guys that i was completely off on this year the derrick henry's the mark ingram's the leonard fournette's the josh jacobs's this is your time to shine people you fucking yelled at me all year go drop some more comments about how fucking dumb i was to fade them i get it we're gonna dive into what I did wrong with each of these guys. Derrick Henry, straight up, straight up. Dude is a fucking beast. 18 touchdowns, rushing crown, 1,700 yards from scrimmage in 15 games. I'll be honest, though. If in the beginning of the year you told me he was going to catch 18 passes, my dumb ass would probably still fade him again. He's a first-round pick going into 2020. Derrick Henry, King Henry, rushing title, extraordinaire. My apologies. You're a fucking animal. The rest of these guys that I really truly believe my process was right on. I actually went back to all the blog posts because I write all the notes that I have for these videos. I write on a blog post first as my scratch notes. So if you ever want to just check out that shit, it's on bigdogsfantasy.com. I went back to these blog posts where the videos I, I trashed these guys in to dive in and see you know what I said about them and how to take away from what I did say. This is what I said about Mark Ingram in the preseason. I think Ingram is a solid NFL running back that benefited tremendously from running behind the Saints' elite run-blocking offensive line for the last few years. Do I think Ingram can be a good runner in Baltimore this year? 
I absolutely do. With Lamar Jackson at quarterback, the lane should be pretty wide. I wouldn't even be surprised if he averaged 4.7, five yards per carry. But how many touches can you really project him for? Not much in the passing game. Maybe the goal line work. But I'm not about to project him for anything more than six touchdowns. Maybe seven. Yes, Jackson should make him more efficient. But you also have to realize that Lamar Jackson is going to run the ball 10 times a game. Still, if not more. That kills clock and a lot of it. This isn't going to be a high scoring offense. In my opinion, they'll rely on their defense and taking time off the clock. If you want 14 carries a game at 5.0 yards per carry with not much else, Ingram is your guy, but not inside the top 40 picks or as a top 20 running back. A lot to unpack there. I was dead accurate on about 90% of what I said, but fatally, fatally, fatally wrong on one thing. I said he'd get about 14 carries a game. He ended up with 210 carries in 15 games, averages out to 13.6 carries a game. So in terms of touches, dead on. I said he'd be very efficient in those carries, probably between 4.7 and 5 yards per carry. He averaged 5 yards per carry. Wouldn't be involved very much in the passing game. 30 targets ranked 45th among running backs. 26 receptions ranked 41st among running backs. Somewhere I did go wrong was I was subjectively excited about Justice Hill. I love the kid as a prospect, uh, but he flunked big time in any sort of impactful way. If you discount week 17, where Ingram didn't play, Hill averaged 3.9 touches per game on the season. But if you followed me along the process throughout the preseason, it was very, very, very clear that Hill was not running in to compete for an impactful role in the offense by the time like the second, third, fourth preseason game rolled along. Uh, here's a little synopsis of what the fuck I'm talking about. So make sure you're following me on Twitter because a lot of my thoughts that don't go up on YouTube go up on the Twitter with Ingram. I said I got a lot of my preseason analysis right and I was fatally wrong somewhere. I just don't think anyone could have predicted this Ravens team to fucking route the entire NFL. 33.2 points per game was number one. San Fran, who was number two, was sub 30 points. So they were by far and away the best offense in the NFL, and it wasn't close. I didn't factor that into my range of outcomes, and I should have. I like to think of things on a spectrum when evaluating players. The floor, the ceiling, and most likely, what's the most likely Nis the most likelihood of the, the range to hit between the floor and the ceiling. I admittedly thought this offense would have its ups and downs. Be an above average offense. I wasn't someone that didn't like Lamar coming in. If you ha got my draft guide last year, I was all over Lamar and I told you he's literally the cheat code in, in those leagues. But Lamar, from a real life NFL perspective, made Ingram, in a sense, a cheat code. So where I predicted him to have six or seven touchdowns, he had 15 touchdowns this year. Tied for third most goal line carries in the season, but the offense was just too good. That's where I lapsed. I did not put the ceiling. I didn't put enough likelihood for the ceiling to happen for Ingram because in terms of the touches in terms of the volume in terms of everything else I was on point with my evaluation however the five receiving touchdowns is totally totally completely unrepeatable but even if he had zero receiving touchdowns he still had 10 rushing touchdowns and I didn't account for the offense being good enough to give him the third most goal line carries in the NFL my running back so that's on me I will need to reinvest my analysis into overall team outlook if I know a guy is going to get 15 touches a game and I think the offense could be above average maybe I need to put his ceiling a little bit higher knowing that he might have a chance to score as many touchdowns as Mark Ingram number six Josh Jankups, the moment you've all been waiting for, understandably so. All summer, I just talked shit about him being objectively unathletic. I bought in on the analytics. I did the same thing for Jacobs that I did for Ingram. When I went back to search exactly what I wrote about Jacobs during the summer, I was like, fuck, this is about to be really embarrassing. I'm going to look like a total idiot. But most of it made sense. Jacobs on film is where he excels. There's no denying that from the big dog. The guy's explosive. He hits the hole hard, can cut on a dime, and has a size and quickness to make a guy miss via power, elusiveness, or burst. But you have to be careful on subjective film analysis because that's exactly what it is, especially on a small sample size like we have with Jacobs. You can make an argument for loving anyone based solely on film. The dude was every bit a fucking beast in the NFL during his rookie season as he was on the film that I watched of him at Alabama. You literally couldn't tackle him. The guy was breaking tackles like pregnant bitches breaking water. He was one of PFF's most elusive running backs on the entire year, rookie or veteran, didn't matter. You don't need analytics to back that shit up and see what you saw on film. My concerns going into the year, yes, he was unathletic, but he did have size. My concern was that we've never seen him handle a big workload. We've never seen him carry the entire workload for a college team let alone an NFL offense. That does not get easier as you play against bigger, faster, stronger guys. So if we never saw it at the college level, I was concerned that he wasn't going to be able to do it at the NFL level. And he did wind up getting hurt. Like throughout the season, this guy was coming in and out of games like it was fucking pick up basketball at your local court. Ankle, foot, whatever. He never missed significant time until the end of the season. So props for him for the toughness. Then he fucked up the shoulder because the dude runs super hard. No denying that. 
but it was an injury concern throughout the year. Me and Noah also talked a lot about Jalen Rashard throughout the offseason. I was concerned about Josh Jacobs' involvement in the uh, receiving game, and he was basically Mark Ingram on a worse offense this year. So the way that Josh Jacobs ended was basically what I projected Mark Ingram to be going into this year. 20 receptions in 13 games, caught one or fewer passes, so one or zero catches in six of 13 games this year. And that's always my concern for a running back like this. Like, unless you're on an amazing offense like Mark Ingram was with scoring opportunities fucking flooding in, you're going to have a hard time proving a great weekly ceiling if you don't catch a lot of passes. Josh Jacobs, if we're being honest, was much more of a floor. He did have exciting games, but he was much more of a floor play this this year than a ceiling play. He had fewer than 12 points in eight of 13 games, 12 half PPR fantasy points. And now they re-signed Jalen Richard. So they still want to use him in the passing game, obviously. All around, Jacobs was fantastic in 2019. There's no denying that. I was wrong about, I guess, him ha handling a word. I, listen, I'll be lying. I'll be lying if I were to sit here and tell you that I'm not worried about him still being able to hold up on a big workload going into 2020. I'm a little concerned about the durability. I really still am. I'm not about to throw up some propaganda about why you shouldn't draft, draft Josh Jacobs. I would say if Jalen Richard didn't re-sign, Jacobs could probably sneak into the back end of the first round next year. I think the hype would get to that point, but I'm not there. Uh, people will still probably be a lot higher on him than I will be. And I also want to leave you with this thread that I found on Twitter the other day from Dino Game at Dino Game Theory. He basically breaks down the anatomy. He says of a top 12 dynasty running back. I took these 12 players, which is the consensus top 12 dynasty running backs at the moment. You can see the list there. He wants to break it down by metrics. So he looks at draft capital. How many of the top 12 were drafted, you know, in this spot or that spot, whatever. The next one was 40 times. A great way to start an argument, but being fast helps with the task of running away from people. Jacobs is the outlier here in the four, six plus. And as you'll see, he is the outlier in almost every measure. The outlier in 40 time, the outlier in speed score, the outlier in best college season and total yards from scrimmage, the outlier in agility score, college target share. He was the outlier. So realistically, the way I, the way I look at all the players are, you know, like, like I said, you're going to be wrong on a lot of shit. You're going to be right on a lot of shit the best thing you could do is give yourself the best probability of being right on players you can never go into a season with a definite outlook on a player because you're never going to get that shit right but you have to give yourself the probability of being closest to what you think is going to happen and over the long run if you do that for every player you know josh jacobs was not a guy that wasn't on my draft board but if i had to pick him in the second or third round he was off because of these athletic skills these lack of production my durability concerns i moved him from like a third round grade to a fourth round grade and overall not having josh jacobs on my team did not kill me whatsoever these are the things that i want you to take away from it a lot of uh, josh jacobs talk let's talk about leonard fournette uh, I guess he falls into the car category with Cooper Cup too, though it was a little different because he didn't actually go into the year injured. He was just someone that I fucking feel like can never stay healthy. So I was like, yeah, I'm definitely not going to fucking draft him because he's probably going to get hurt again because that's what he do does every fucking year. And Dr. Jesse Morse was like, yeah, there's no way I could touch him because he's going to get hurt again. And then he didn't get hurt again. But as you can see throughout this article, I am extremely risk averse when it comes to injuries in the early rounds. Something I frequently say to fantasy football people, don't find injuries on your fantasy football team because they will find you. And realistically... Fournette wasn't good as an NFL running back this year. A pure volume back who had an injury designation coming into the year or a higher likelihood of getting injured really was a pure volume back. I mean, I have the stats right here. Third most touches of all running backs in the NFL this year, 265 carries. Obviously, the reason that he was fantasy relevant was because of the receiving production that he put up. 76 fucking receptions on 100 targets. He scored three touchdowns on the year. He had the one massive game in week four where he went for 225 yards on 29 carries. Otherwise, he was fucking terrible. My thoughts on Fournette going into the year were that he's an okay running back by a talent standpoint on a pretty bad team with a pretty bad offensive line. And again, I think he's a mediocre talent. The team isn't good. They were 6-10. and 10. They averaged 18.8 points per game, 26th in the NFL. Their offensive line, 27th in run blocking per Football Outsiders, 25th per Pro Football Focus. Leonard Fournette as an individual had the 38th best run blocking performance per player profiler. So again, I didn't think the offensive line was good and they were not. I just never, ever, 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 ever thought Fournette would hit 100 targets. His his involvement in the passing game this year was fucking otherworldly. It almost didn't make sense. So I compiled some stats. Over the last 12 years, only 13 different running backs have eclipsed 100 targets in a single season. 12 years, 13 running backs. They all were legitimate pass catchers. Eckler, Tariq Cohen, C. Mack, James White, Saquon, Kamara, Lev Bell, David Johnson, Danny Woodhead, Matt Forte, Jamal Charles, Darren Sproles, Ray Rice. Maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like whatever the fuck Fournette did this year was a complete outlier because he does not fall into that category. He can catch the ball, but he's not a pass-catching running back. The way I look at it, and this is probably discussion 
for another video, maybe in the running back rankings video, which I'll drop in maybe a month or so. If you're not schemed into the game plan as far as being a pass catching running back, using the slot, getting wheel routes, etc., then as soon as your team starts collecting more legitimate pass catchers on the outside as a tight end, as other running backs that can catch the ball, the targets are probably going to start coming out of your share. The guy had 100 targets this year and 27 air yards. 100 targets, 27 total air yards. He's just a dump off guy that happened to be in the right place at the right time. And I don't think you can rely on that year over year. So for net, yes, I, I realize that I'm having a very hard time taking some of these L's right now, but I think most of my pre-summer analysis was kind of spot on for a lot of these things and just randomness fucking happens in the NFL. And that's what happened with Leonard Fournette. So regardless, yeah, tons of touches. I didn't want to deal with the injury risk. So I faded. He's played a ton of straight games now, you know, going back to week 17 this year, going back to week 17 of last year, those are the only two games he's missed for suspension and illness. So those were not injury related. So while carrying a monster workload, he was able to stay healthy for a long time. So maybe that injury designation does start to fade off, but I still adding up the other pieces of this analysis. I still don't think he's a very good running back. And I'm probably not going to be someone that drafts him in the first round of next year's draft, maybe early second. I don't really know we'll have to see what happens but probably a guy i'm staying away from again all righty all righty all righty all righty enough individual players let's get back to general strategy we got three more on the list of top 10 if y'all are enjoying this video all i ask is that you hit the thumbs up button subscribe to the channel if you're new we're going to be doing too much fucking fantasy football stuff over the next lifetime uh this is just a quick break in the middle of this video after I i'm in the middle of editing it right now and about 30 minutes or so into it my camera had cut out and i recorded a second piece of the video and audio and i realized that the uh <coughs> audio for the next 10 or so minutes is going to be a little bit fucked up i got the new shore microphone and i recorded it the second part in the wrong software so if you are wearing headphones listening to this it is only going to be playing out of the left ear if you listen to it i think on your laptop or just like freely through a speaker or through just through your phone without headphones then you should be able to hear it in its entirety so i apologize for this we're going to fix it we're top 10 lessons learned about fucking microphones starting right now let us move forward with the list. We're done talking about the fat boys. If you are listening via podcast, whatever, uh, I would really appreciate a thumbs up on the video if you're getting some value out of this. If you are on iTunes or Spotify, whatever, uh, leaving a rating and review would be. We're trying to take over in 2020. It's our fucking year, baby. I'm sorry. I won't yell like that again. So number eight, this is something I didn't learn this year. This is something that I will pry into your heads year after year after year, whether it's fantasy football or life or business or even girlfriends, diversify the goddamn revenue. Always diversify the revenue. It goes back to, to lesson number one, because I love some guys, I hate some guys, I don't care about other guys. I always diversify my teams with varying players in varying leagues, varying scoring setting. Fortunately for me this year, the guys I did invest heavy on, I usually don't take guys, maybe I'll take them in two leagues, but I usually don't go three. I did that a lot with Aaron Jones. I did it a lot with Austin Eckler and I play in all super flex leagues. I did it a lot with Deshaun Watson and Russell Wilson. But there are also guys that I like that could have easily just as been on different teams like Carrion Johnson instead of Aaron Jones, Matt Breda, Jared Goff, given all their preseason ADPs. So I always diversify my teams. And this is more for people who play in multiple leagues. I feel like at this point, a lot of season long players don't just play in one league. And if you do, you're probably not watching a video about season long fantasy football in fucking February. So this won't really be relevant to you. Y'all probably play in multiple leagues. So always diversify the revenue because you're going to be wrong on a lot of shit. And so am I. And that's why I do it. Like I would have liked to have owned more Derrick Henry, Cooper Cup, Leonard Fournette, of course. And I should have. But the reason you diversify, say you loved a guy like Juju Smith-Schuster, which I did. Somehow I ended up with zero Juju Smith-Schuster this year, which is phenomenal. But if you loved him and you were picking at the 205 in two different leagues, you could have went Juju Smith-Schuster in one league. Boom, that's done. But if you did it twice, you fucked yourself everywhere. Instead of Juju in the second league, you could have went with Michael Thomas. And boom, you won. You're not done. You fucking won because you diversified the revenue. This shit really works, I'm telling you. Taking players that you don't like works. Taking players that you're indifferent towards work. I'm not saying go out of your way, bad value to pick one guy over another because you already have that guy. Pick guys that you haven't invested in yet that are going around that pick. When it's a tiebreaker, lean towards diversifying the portfolio, thus diversifying the revenue, thus diversifying the profit. Lesson number nine, the title I put on this was well-rounded teams, arrow, arrow, arrow. This was actually the first year I can remember while drafting, I went out of my way to make sure that my teams were well-rounded and it really worked. This was the best year of fantasy I've ever had. I was only in five season long leagues and I actually didn't win any of them, but I got to the championship in four of them by diversifying 
players I drafted by hitting the waiver wire well, but getting in four out of five is difficult to do. I don't care how, how much fucking time you do to prep. There's just so much luck and randomness that goes into the game that doing that is pretty tough. And I, I consider it probably one of my best years I've ever had. And I think it's because of a lot of the lessons that I've learned. Maybe it's a one-year sample size and it's too small, but I really, really enjoyed going about drafting this way. And this is definitely relevant to drafting, not obviously during the season. What a lot of people do preach in the industry, and I'm starting to think is is wrong is drafting based on value that meant going running back running back running back because those are the best guys on the board i would do that this year i actually shied away from that approach i love the idea of having one stud rb1 and one stud wide receiver one in my lineups since i play in super flex leagues having you know a high-end quarterback one with an rb1 and a wide receiver one within the first three picks right and that's what led me to having a lot of guy a lot of like deshaun watson this year which also led me to almost be suicidal in week 16 but that's beside the point here's the thing about drafting based on value value is not objective Value is what people that create content throughout the summer create. Value is is not real. It's just a, a product of what random people in the world think. Like going based off ADPs is great, except that they're just like man-made. Evan Silva tweets something out and it makes someone's ADP go up or down. When you draft based off value, what happens is you end up being really heavy at one position. Like you start off running back, running back, running back. You make your team very, 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 very vulnerable. Like for instance, the, the one league that I didn't make the playoffs in this year, the, the Big Dogs Staff League, I didn't take a wide receiver until I think round six. I took three running backs, a quarterback, a tight end. It was tight end premium, so I took one early. It actually might've been round seven when I took the first wide receiver. And I'll be honest, it was the last draft of the summer and I was like, I wanted to finish my fucking drafts and I was messing around and experimenting with different drafts. I didn't really care at this point. After fading wide receiver for so long, my wide receiver one was Calvin Ridley. I mean, this year he was a mix of like great but inconsistent at best. And then he got hurt. The four picks that followed him were like Josh Gordon, Marvin Jones, Michael Gallup, Geronimo Allison. So you can imagine how my team wound up. I was far, 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 far too vulnerable at wide receiver, especially in a league that was that deep. We started a ton of guys. The, the starting lineups were monstrous. The benches were very big. So it was very, hard to get guys off the waiver wire, which is another thing I should have factored in. If you're playing in really big leagues with really deep waivers and really big starting lineups, and there's not going to be a lot on the waiver wire, don't make yourself very vulnerable at one position because it's going to be very hard to make up ground there. But for instance, I'm looking at the board now, and it was until round six that I faded wide receiver. My fifth round pick was Sony Michelle. A couple of guys that were still left on the board at that pick, Amari Cooper, Cooper Cup, Kenny Galladay, DJ Moore. So not a good pick, Nick. Not good, sir. So again, I echo this to you. Value is something you could draft based on, right? You could do draft-based value, but value a lot of the time is just perceived value and doesn't translate into actual success. I mean, realistically, again, value is just this made-up thing based on public ADP data that comes from the same fucking sources. So it's, 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 it's fucking a conspiracy, man. Fucking value-based drafting is a fucking conspiracy. I'm gonna make t-shirts like that and fuck value-based drafting is what I'm saying. It's much easier to move pieces around smartly and attack the waiver wire, build an all-around stacked roster through a well-rounded team. If you're stacked at running back or only at wide receiver, the other positions on your team become extremely vulnerable and your wide receiver one is a wide receiver two in reality and making them more likely to bust, right? Or if he gets hurt, you're really, 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 really fucked. A more well-rounded team will have depth or at least will have a legit wide receiver one. If that guy gets hurt, then that wide receiver two, the vulnerable team had or would have had as their wide receiver one becomes a wide receiver one. So you're, you're, you're giving yourself a blanket of security. The other thing a more well-rounded team does is it lets you be more flexible on the waiver wire as well. If you don't have a glaring weakness, you can go after whoever the fuck you want on the waiver wire. If you have a huge weakness at running back, you're not going to be using your number one waiver on a wide receiver. You're not going to be throwing $50 of your fab budget on a wide receiver. You could do it to anyone you want. Best player available, best position available to block somebody fucking else. doesn't matter. So fuck value-based drafting. Number 10. And the last thing that we're going to talk about Statistical regression is not a fucking thing in the NFL. No, let me back up. It is. It is. It is. But not over the course of one season. An NFL season is 16 games. That is the problem, my friends. Statistical regression is absolutely a thing. But for the NFL, it's so fucking hard to know when that statistical regression is going to come, right? The NBA, 82 games. The MLB, 162 games. Obviously, you're going to be able to point to statistical regression much easier with those data points than a 16-game sample size in the NFL. One thing goes wrong. Two things go wrong, and that's the entire season of statistics boosted up a tremendous amount on a player's box score or stat sheet. You could say something like Aaron Jones is going to score fewer than 19 touchdowns in 2020 because that's how many he scored in 2019. He's not going to do it again in 2020. Like, fucking thank you, but none of y'all with a fucking lick of confidence can tell me how many touchdowns he is going to score. Yes, it's going to be regression, but not the point is it's not it's not helpful regression. Is he going to score 17 touchdowns next year? Is he going to score 14? Is he going to score 11? Is he going to score 7? Seven? I don't fucking know. When people start to use regression statistically as a fucking piece of analysis, it doesn't help because we can't 
have any idea where it's going to be coming from or when it's going to come because it's such a small sample size. And then you just add a couple other pieces of context into such a small sample size and it, it's almost useless, right? Jones, one of the best goal line backs in college at when he was at UTEP. And he has been arguably the best goal line back in the NFL despite his stature since he's come into the league. He was top five in the NFL in goal line carries behind Aaron Rodgers. So when we talk about statistical regression, 90% of the time it's shit analysis. I guess his touchdown numbers might go down, but he's still in a phenomenal situation. He's still a phenomenal goal line back. So you can't tell me with any sort of certainty how far it's going to go down. When you're looking at touchdown rate for a running back or a wide receiver or a quarterback, right? The difference between like eight fantasy ranks from RB like nine to 16 is a defender slipping one time a terrible missed tackle over 16 games and a 200 touch sample size that can make a massive difference statistically again NBA MLB these numbers are fucking exponentially bigger so it's a lot easier to understand where the outliers are those things work themselves out over the long term so again this isn't a way to say that regression is not something to factor in but for the most part when you hear it in fantasy football analysis unless it comes with really good context behind it it's just fluff to sound smart so again i say fuck value-based drafting now for real that's going to cap up this episode. I don't even know how long that was. I feel like I was just fucking yelling at you guys. I'm literally sweating for the last hour. It's it's good to get back on here. It's good to speak with you on a human to human basis. I miss this, y'all. I miss this every Thursday coming at you, coming at your face. Fantasy football redraft season long stuff. We will pick it up in the summer. Again, if you found this information valuable, helpful, informational, I highly doubt it was entertaining, but a thumbs up button would be very much appreciated. A comment down below letting me know what kind of content you would like to see over the course of the off season. And right now, our our big dogs draft guide of course is on pre-order pricing which is the lowest you're going to be able to get at any point for the remainder of the off season big dogs draft guide.com i love y'all i'm out i was about to dab but i'm not about to do that in the first fucking video of 2020 bye